Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you here. Um, we'll give it another minute here as everybody slowly trickles in. Um, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself first. My name is Katya and I am a client relationship manager here on the North America side with the Virtual Forge. And with me today, I have Tim Voltz, our senior BI developer, in, also located in North America with me at the Virtual Forge. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot from Tim today and a lot less from me. But as we have people trickling in, I do want to take care of some housekeeping items before we really dive into things here. So today, as you know, we'll be talking about uh, several pillars of best practices in Power BI. So we have a lot of information to pack and a lot of various chapters. Um, we definitely want you to ask any questions that you have and participate. So what we'll be doing is if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the LinkedIn comments here live. And as we go through each chapter, we'll do a little Q&A at the end of each section. And we'll, Tim will give you a bit of a heads up as to when that is happening. Uh, any questions so far? I think we're doing good. Excellent. Um, it looks like everything we're doing well here. Um, as you have, if you have any questions, again, as I mentioned, please feel free to leave them directly in the comments here in LinkedIn. Feel free to say hi chat with anybody that you see in the comments in there. Uh, and we'll give you a bit of a heads up as to when the question section will be coming up and we'll give you some time to put those in there. If we don't have any questions to start, um, I'd like to give a little bit of background on Tim. So he's been working with Power BI for over six years now, but working specifically with data projects for over 15 years now. So he knows quite a bit of what he is talking about here. And uh, today we'll walk you through a, several different pieces of the best practices, as I mentioned. Please don't worry, you will get a recap of the slides as well as a recording of this webinar after um, at, at the end of this. So feel free, you don't need to be screenshotting or taking detailed handwritten notes. You will get a copy of the slide deck after. And again, as I mentioned, please feel free to add any comments in or any questions in the comments. Um, with that, Tim, I will let you take it away from here and I will disappear. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Katya. I uh, want to just a second, Katya, is uh, welcome to everybody for coming out. And thanks for everyone to coming out today. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about building better reports with best practices. As Katya mentioned, this is me, you know, a lot of time spent in data projects and Power BI. Moving on here. Sorry here, my slide is stuck. There we go. Hang on one second, everyone. There we go. Oh, we jumped way ahead here. Not sure what's going on with the slides. So with the slides not paying attention to me, here we go. Let me get back to the slideshow here. Apologies for that. A little bit of a technical difficulty. Um, so if that's not going to load, what we'll do is instead of, here we go. All right. In fact, I will just say to heck with the slides. We'll just start from here and we will keep with the <clears throat> agenda here. So what we're gonna do is just, we're gonna go front to back here, taking a look at best practices, starting off with Power Query, moving into the, moving into relationships, relationship building, uh, taking a look at DAX, looking at the visual side, and then a, a, a quick piece at the end, where we're gonna talk about collaboration and reusability. All right, so what we're gonna do is we are going to hop in and right off the bat, I wanna talk really quickly about two things that you should always be mindful of when you start any Power BI file. And that is uh, knowing there's two options that you can set in Power BI. And I'll just flip over here so we can see those. And I have the file path there. You can get there through file, then to, to options. 
And what we're going to look at here is down in the current file and data load, two things that often get missed. One of these is in the relationships. There's this auto detect new relationships after data is loaded can be useful. I recommend highly, highly staying away from this because Power BI will pick whatever it wants to, to do. If it finds a, a way to create a relationship between tables, it will, and it can create several at once. It can create a sort of mess of spaghetti going on back there. So I would recommend highly as a best practice, keeping it uh, unchecked, especially if you're starting out, <clears throat> it's good to force yourself to create these relationships. The other thing you want to check here is this auto date time. Now, for one, as a best practice, you should always be have you should always have a calendar table uh, in your data model, whether you're creating it via Power Query or DAX, it should always be there. Um, but unchecking this is very important because what happens is Power BI is going to create date tables underneath any table over here. Uh, on on our right hand side, any data table that has a date in it, Power BI will create a separate date table for that uh, for that specific table of your model. What that does is <clears throat> ultimately what that does is it's going to bloat your data model and you won't even know it. Just so you just so you're aware of that. Go ahead, I'm going to hop into Power Query. All right. And so what we're going to take a look at is a couple of different pieces here. Uh, where we're going to start off with, and you're going to have to listen to me just talk for a second here is transformations okay so what you want to always do is transform your data and it's very tempting to just go here you know when you first start off find the source that find the find the data source that you want to use connect to that data source and just load that data straight into power bi <clears throat> i recommend against that i recommend always always taking the transform option whether that's through here once you've connected or just going directly through here and opening up power query itself Part of the reason for that is, is that when Power BI <clears throat> imports a data source, particularly from Excel, it's going to guess at data types. Sometimes it won't even set the data types, and you'll just have mixed data types in your columns. Very important to note uh, that <clears throat> you should always be checking those as a best practice for sure. Always be checking on your data types uh, because you could have something that should be a number formatted as a, as a text or a string. You won't even know it until you try to create a measure and it doesn't work. It's going to drive you crazy. It's happened to me, you know, dozens of times for sure. The other thing too, is that no matter how clean you think your data is, no matter how much time you've spent uh, on the back end cleaning things up, it's always good to just double check, make sure that your data doesn't have any anomalies. It looks like, you know, it looks exactly the way it should. <clears throat> and there, you know, there's just, uh, you know, just a few other things too. For instance, adding columns to your data. Uh, so it's much better to add them there in Power Query than to add them on the front end. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly, but always, always, always go through Power Query. Power Query is definitely your friend. Uh, where I'm gonna go next in here is, so we talked a little bit about <clears throat> data quality and how would you mitigate that? Well, always, you know, as you load things up, again, I would recommend always coming up here to this, to this tab up in here to the View tab, there are three settings in here that allow you to check on your data. So let me find a good column. We'll take a look at something that's a little more variable here. Let's go with our unit price column. What we're going to do is, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check this column. To show us, it's going to give us a quick look here at whether we have any errors and whether or not any of these are empty or null cells here. The one thing that's really cool to note too is as you hover over this, it pops up this little window here that gives you those numbers. And if there were problems, you can click on these three dots and you have different ways to mitigate this very quickly. You can remove the duplicates, you can remove empty, uh, empty rows, you can remove error rows, you can replace any errors in the column, all very, very useful things. You can even keep errors here if you wanted to go through and diagnose those. The other, the next setting here, we have this column distribution. So column distribution is very good, is a good good uh, uh, value here, especially, here we go. So if you're unfamiliar with what is going on in your underlying data, for instance, if you're connecting to a new data source and you need to identify primary keys, that's really, that's where this really comes in handy. Now we know that this is a sales table, but we can see that we have a number of distinct values, same thing you hover over to see this, uh, see it in a little more detail. You can see that we have distinct values, which are you know, distinct values in here, or we have unique values, which are values that are not only distinct, but appear only once. 
Uh, when you have both the distinct, the distinct and unique values matching, so we were ahead to a different table, for instance, uh, like a, a dimension table, you have a primary key. You have a key that you can use, and you can join. You can use that to create relationships out to your uh, fact tables in your data model. So, just a quick note too: dimension tables. Just for uh, anyone not familiar with the with the, with the uh, <clears throat> naming conventions here, dimension tables are generally those tables that you want to use to slice your data in different ways. So, if I wanted to uh, look at look at data by month my the calendar table i would use would be a dimension table on the other hand uh, what we're looking at here would be a fact table this is our sales table it has a number of fields in here that we're going to aggregate um, <clears throat> so any table that has fields where you want to do some aggregations those are going to be your fact tables so there's a two fundamental distinctions in every data model again should have both of those should have dimension tables and fact tables and we'll talk a little bit more about how those should relate in a couple minutes here Last thing I do want to bring up, though, when we're looking at, at our, some of our quality uh, previews is if we're going to, let's go to our column profile. Now, our column profile is probably my favorite because it blends the best of both worlds of the quality and distribution. It gives me some of those numbers, uh, you know, a nice basically histogram down here where we're able to see the distribution of our values throughout the table. So, for instance, if there is something where you think you have a primary, key, where it should be a primary key, but there is, well, there's one value in there that shows up twice. This is gonna help you find that. This is gonna help you mitigate that. And you'll be able to find this and you can actually use this down here. Actually click on some of these things and I can actually take a look at what's going on here. <clears throat> and I can actually filter my report based on these values and I can find, locate and fix them. Very, very powerful tools, very good to use. I recommend using these all the time. So the next thing I wanted to touch on here is, is when you're transforming a table. So thematically, these are tables that I've hosted that are hosted on Excel. I'm going to turn some of these off because they're just going to get in our way and make things a little slow. So keep things moving a little speedily. I'm going to turn those off and we'll come back and we'll talk about <clears throat> steps. So applied steps here over on the right hand side. Every transformation you make gets shows up in the in this pane here on the right hand side. These are your transformation steps. What you want to do, uh, <clears throat> what you want to note here. These are automatic. This happened when I pulled this data in from uh, SharePoint. But additional transformations you're going to make here, it is very critical, very critical within Power Query. I think it is a best practice to always do the steps, transformation steps that are going to either reduce the width of your table by removing columns or uh, reduce the depth of your table, the number of rows, which is by filtering. Uh, and part of the reason for that, why this is so important, is because of the way Power Query works. So Power Query itself uh, would be called what's it's what's called a lazy evaluator. So it'll go through its steps to figure out what to do next. Uh, it'll find the most efficient way to produce uh, to produce an end result, your end result of your as being your table. What it tends to do is it streams data uh, through through steps as, it, as much as it can. It streams data. When it can't stream data, it buffers an entire table. So you can imagine if you have millions of rows in a table. And it's streaming. What I mean by streaming is, if I apply a if I apply a filter, it's going to go row by row until it finds until it has all the all the rows that meet a condition that I've applied. So by making things smaller and narrower, as a, from a table perspective, uh, far better performance, significantly better performance. For instance, if we knew that you know right off the bat that we have no desire to ever look at 2017 here in our in our sales table. What we want to do here is we're going to go in and we can just apply a, a simple date filter and we can grab everything that's coming after. Yeah. Let's just pop this okay, case. Come on, filter. All right, filters are moving. There we go. All right, here we are. So we can say everything that's after, we're going to put in uh, 1231, 2017. In. And we'll just filter that. And again, easy enough. Filter down, really easy. Also, just real quickly, if you do add a step that you don't want anymore, there's this X here. You can always just click on this X. That'll get rid of that step for you. 
here, whether it's by filtering or removing columns, which can be achieved through our home tab here. Uh, we have two options here to you know, choose columns or remove columns. There's a difference here. So I always say this, if you know that your data set <clears throat> here, when you're removing columns, if you know that your data here, your sales data is never going to be, get any wider the table, I would say use choose columns. You can pick the columns because that's going to specify what columns get included. Any new columns that would show up would get excluded. Uh, alternatively, if you think that at some point down the line, you think you're going to want to add some useful information that you'll want to use at some point for you know uh, measures or a visual down the line, use remove columns because that specifies the columns that you want to take out of the file and everything else stays. Just a quick note there as well. And then coming down here, when we're talking a little bit more. One thing I did want to just kind of a little bonus thing that I, you know, we don't have on our agenda, but I did want to point out is how to keep things organized here. So I did, I do typically when I build a data model tables here. So if somebody were to pick this report up, They'd know what I. They'd know what I'm doing. They'd know what how everything works, and to do that, we basically just right click and we can move to a group. You can either uh, assign a new group or you can create a group that doesn't exist. You can create groups that don't exist yet. So that's very useful. Also here too, you can always in your applied steps, you can rename your steps so it's clear what's happening. Even uh, more useful is you can right click on any step and go to properties, and then I can leave little breadcrumbs here. And I'll just, you know, this is the breadcrumb. I'll click OK. And then what happens here in Power Query is you get this little icon here, and somebody can hover over, just hover over the step, and they can see what your, what kind of notes you left there, what sort of breadcrumbs you left for other people. Very useful. Uh, one of the last things that we want to take a look at here, though, is a calendar. And I mentioned this. This calendar, having a calendar on your data model, is extremely useful. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. I like it as a sort of base level here where, you know, when we're looking at calendars, there's a couple of steps here. Uh, you can you can find this generally, you know, everywhere, in the, pretty much everywhere in the Power BI community if you're looking for it. This is the one way to do it where effectively what we're doing is we're specifying a date here uh, to start. And that's going to correspond with the dates that I want from the sales table list of dates. And typically what you want to do is you want to get dates based on the duration between the current date, which can be which is actually this uh, function inside of Power Query, date time .local now gives the current time on your machine. And then we have our source step, which is our initial date. So it's going to give us a list of dates. It's going to convert that because what happens is it comes through Power Query as a list. So what you want to do is convert it. I'm going to rename our date column, and then we're going to change the type of that column so it's the correct type. Now, one of the things that's also worth noting here is if for any reason, let's say you're taking your data from a database and you have a date time column, one of the first things you need you should do is get rid of the time component because that is very uh, that that takes up a lot of space in the memory to to have a date and time together because it creates a lot of unique values. So what we're going to do is we'll just get rid of that, and then to create your table. I'm just going to replace that step. And then what we're going to do, now that we have our date properly formatted, what well, you want to add to the table or add to your date table, you go to the Add Columns tab. <clears throat> and over here, through the UI, you can do most of the things that you want to do. So we let's say we want to know uh, the year. We can click that, and we get a year column. And do this, because if you if you have another ancillary date, let's say we added the start of the year here, for instance. And I kept this column highlighted, then click here again. It will always good just to make sure you come back here. But again, you can use this to add as many fields as you want, as many fields as you think are useful. So we can add a month number. You know, we can add uh, the name of the month. We can throw in you know, our weeks, a quarter. Orders to do additional transformations to add the to add a, a letter to that, but we can build out just through the UI uh, and with a few other just a few other uh, steps here. You can build out a very robust calendar that's going to let you do a lot of uh, a lot of Power BI and really works well when you're 
doing transformations, especially for time intelligence. The <clears throat> section, I have a parameters and functions. These are all parameters. Parameters get added through here, through our manage parameters section. And we can use these very, we can use these in a lot of places. Basis. So back here, when we filtered our sales table, for instance, I have a start date parameter here. And if I go to sales and I wanted to instead, let's say I wanted to filter my order date again, and I wanted to think I, uh, after a start date, so let's say after or equal to here. And what I'm going to do is rather than pick a date, I'm going to use this drop down and I'm going to pick a parameter. And it's a date. Now, the great thing about this, and I'll show you very quickly before we transition to our next section here, is that once I've applied the start date here to this table, I'm actually able to be a transform date in the desktop application. I'm actually able to edit these parameters on the fly Start with for development purposes. I'm always able to change that through here and change that back. This also comes in very handy too, especially on a database. If you have multiple database environments, as you know, a, a stage, a UA, or, you know, development, a UAT, and a, and a production environment, you can use this too for source connections. You can switch connections very easily on the report. So parameters, very, 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 very handy tool here. All right, so heading back over to our deck, and we're going to transition to questions in a second. Just wanted to recap. Always use Power Query. Uh, make sure you're using uh, your data preview. Always reduce the length and width of your table uh, as soon, you know, as early as possible. Always use a calendar table. Parameters are great to use if you have uh, things that change frequently, like environments, or you want to change the date filters on the fly uh, for a particular table. Parameters work well there. And finally, you know, using the query and step descriptions are great to document your work. Uh, we will take a brief moment here for any questions. All right, so um, I, I see a, I see a really good uh, question here coming through. Um, <clears throat> so uh, somebody had mentioned uh, using the calendar functions for instance inside of in uh, on the Dax end rather than the uh, rather than Power. Yes, I just saw that. Yes, that is an excellent excellent question. So I tend to use Power Query. The reason I use Power Query to create a table rather than DAX, and kind of stealing my thunder when we get to the DAX section, but nope, that's that's fine. Um, the tables created in Power Query are subject to compression. So as as you import the data, that table data that data gets compressed as it's going through, and it's a very powerful compression algorithms that very very uh, really shrink the data footprint. Uh, tables created via DAX. The you know, and there's nothing wrong with creating a calendar via DAX. The only thing to keep in mind is that a larger calendar created in DAX doesn't uh, pass through the same compression algorithms because it's created after uh, after those after that import runs. So what happens is a very large calendar, for instance, with you know, let's say 20 years of date, uh, 20 years of dates in it, is going to potentially bloat the data model and may impede performance. So I tend to Say I tend to lean towards Power Query in this sense, in this way, to create my to create my tables, only because you can leverage the leverage the algorithm. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Then that is exactly what I was saying. Calendar and calendar auto work. Calendar auto. The difference is calendar is a very good function. Calendar auto is going to create a calendar based on every uh, uh, basically every date that's sitting inside your data model. Okay, so Real let's quick. head back over just, here, head back over sorry, into sorry, our Tim, deck. Real quick, let me just jump in and here. For head to our one. next section, just a quick one. Um, it looks like we have a bit of a delay happening. Yes, uh, there's, there's about a three minute delay happening between what we're presenting and what you're seeing on LinkedIn. So please feel free to, again, just reiterating, post questions as they come up for you, and we'll keep rolling through them so we don't have chunks where, we're, where we announce questions and then we're, we have dead space. So feel free to just post them as they come up for you, and we'll get to them at the end of each section. 
uh, and hopefully that will ensure smooth streaming for you. Thanks everyone. Tim, I'll let you get back to it. All right, thanks Katya for that little note here. All right, so really quickly, wanted to talk a little bit about relationships. Uh, there's only a few pieces here to really touch on. We're gonna kill off this thing here because I made that change, it's gonna just annoy us. All right, so here we are on the relationship tab. <clears throat> Uh, a couple of things we want to touch on here. Um, <clears throat> I know that I've occasionally you've, I've come across this question here, so I just wanted to touch on why we would even bother to create relationships when we have merge functionality in Power Query, where we can take uh, <clears throat> all of the tables that we want, combine them into one giant table. Why wouldn't we just do that? Why would we go through the trouble of you know coming in here and doing all of this? Well, part of the reason is that Power uh, Power BI is optimized to use relationships. Uh, it, in fact, what it does is if I were to, let's say, look for sales based on a product category here, right? What Power BI is going to do, is it's going to take uh, values from the product table, values from the sales table, send that back to its, you know, the underlying query engine, query engines to be precise, to produce the result that's going to show up on a visual. If we had a single table, so what's going to happen there is that it's going to take a lot longer. It's going to take a lot longer to do these things. So ultimately, the way because of the way that Power Query work, because of the way that Power BI works and its and its query engines work underneath uh, underneath the surface with DAC, uh, you know, translating DAC statements, it's best to use relationships for sure because it's it's going to improve the efficiency significantly. Uh, to that note, uh, again. The using a star schema where we have uh, you know connections just connections from dimensions to fact tables not dimension to dimension not fact to fact using uh, a star schema is optimal inside of Power BI for the same sort of reason. So for instance, if we had a, a snowflake model which I've seen used before and I have used those in the past um, for sure. But if we had one, so in this table here, we have a category, we have product, we have category and subcategory. Now we could have two additional tables here. We have a product table, a subcategory table, and a, and a category table. What we want to do though, in terms of our dimensions and our relationships is reduce the number of hops that Power BI needs to make to construct uh, its query to send back to the query engine. So by doing things in this sort of star schema model where we just have the connection of single relationships between dimension only between dimensions and fact tables as much as possible uh, that is ultimately going to really improve your performance here as well and a couple of other things to note aside from just making sure that we just have these dimension to fact table relationships as much as possible there are exceptions to this um, one of the things we also want to check on here is that our relationships between dimensions and fact tables are one to many where the one so the unique value is on the dimension side and the many value, the word from, from a database terminology of the foreign key is on the fact table side. You can see that's represented here by the one and the star here. Again, not always possible. Sometimes you do get the many to many relationships in here. That, that's okay. But the other, if you do have a many to many relationship, the one thing that you should be aware of is that as, again, as much as possible, the direction of your filter here should the cross filter directions should always be going from the dimension to the fact table. Very important. Uh, what could happen is, uh, especially what could happen in your data model is if you have a what's called a bi-directional relationship, it can create some ambiguity on Power BI side because what Power BI is going to do, it's always it's going to look for the most efficient path to filter things. And with a bi-directional relationship, it's possible that Power BI could find more than one path. Uh, when it finds more than one path, it does get very angry, and it will tell you that it found more than one path here. So, at the end of the day, the just the best thing to do is try to avoid bidirectional or, you know, both having a filter flowing from fact to dimension and dimension to fact. Try to avoid that as much as possible, because you know, at the end of the day, it can produce some oddball results. So, just to reiterate here and and address any questions. Um, <clears throat> So relationships between tables, always better than merging. Uh, relationships should uh, always be between dimensions and fact tables in a, fact, in a star schema. And as much as possible, we should leverage a one-to-many relationship. So let's see if we have any questions from the audience. All 
All right. So if we don't, if we have no questions, I will move on to our DAX section. And this is where I think we talked a little bit about uh, <clears throat> measures versus calculated columns. Or we talked a little bit about calculated columns in particular. So when we're talking about measures versus calculated columns, one of the things to keep in mind here is that uh, the difference obviously between the two is that the measures are not persistent objects in the data uh, in your data model. Measures only exist when they're used in a visual. So if I, you know, if when I create a measure, it doesn't exist until it exists. It's not materialized. It's the technical, say, the more technical term here. It's not materialized until I drop that onto a visual in the in on on, on the canvas. Calculated columns, which also leverage DAX, are better for stamping. Table values and tables, um, and they become part of the data model. Now, like the like I said with the calendar earlier, calculated columns are added via DAX, which means that they are not subject to any compression that you uh, algorithms that you you might be they might leverage when you're using Power Query to load your data. So, one thing from a best practice note. Uh, when we're talking about measures and calculated columns is to use calculated columns sparingly. I don't think that calculated columns are bad in and of themselves, but a lot of calculated columns in your data model can ultimately slow things down over time uh, from a performance perspective, particularly when it comes to a data refresh. All right, so just one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about that. Uh, the other note here that before we hop over into Power BI, is when we're talking about explicit versus implicit measures. Uh, it can be very tempting to just sort of drag fields out of tables into a visual. Uh, in fact, if we hop over over here into Power BI, we can see here on the front end, in, you know, quantity sold. I'm just dragged in the quantity sold value. Power BI just basically just aggregates this for me uh, when I pull it in. That's because that's from a performance perspective. It's easier. To, it's better to do that at a table level. However, when you're doing this in a visual, it's always better to use an explicit measure, which is one you've defined via DAX. A uh, reason for that is Power BI does its little weird things where it's going to guess at what you're trying to do with a field when you drop it in a visual. And uh, <clears throat> almost embarrassingly so, I have to confess, when I first started working with Power BI on one of my first major projects about a... No, I'd say probably a good two weeks went by on a particular visual before I noticed that, you know, the value, let's say the value in a bar chart, for instance, let's say, well, I think it was a bar chart at the time, value or a column chart, the value in my column chart was actually showing me an average rather than a sum. And what I wanted was a sum in there. But Power BI picked a value and it's close enough here. It was, cl it looked close enough and proportionally that I didn't notice that it was doing the wrong thing. So reason why it's like considered you would say best practice to for except for a table visual a table or matrix visual i would say best practice if you're dry, if you need to put an aggregation in the visual use a measure to do it again and the only place i wouldn't do that is in a table especially a particularly wide table you need to use because in that case measures need to be calculated for each row and that's ultimately going to slow things down a little bit so uh, for the most part though Always create a measure, always use measures to drop, uh, to, to add values into your visual objects on your canvas. Okay, so one thing that's the first best, you know, one of the biggest best practices I can bring up, and this was something I came on a little late in the game, probably working in Power BI for about a year or so before I started really to understand why to need to do this, is to make your own measure taste and make a separate measure table. Uh, you, Power BI will create a measure anywhere in any table. Anything I can right click on is going to let me create a measure on it. But creating a measure in a separate table is very useful because when I, if I were to hand this report, for instance, from collaborating with a teammate and we're sharing a report back and forth, I don't have to go digging for measures. I know exactly where they are in the data model from here. Now I can you know, always search for them for sure. But it's much easier to locate things in a uh, measure table. Very straightforward. We're going to use this enter data uh, button up here on the home tab in the ribbon. And once this pops up, we're going to give it a name. 
I typically use the pound sign and measures. Measures is a, is a quote unquote reserved word in Power BI. It's a reserved keyword. So you need to put something before that or call the table something else. And I just like to, you know, you can do you underscore measure. But what you'll do is you'll load, you know, you, you'll create this, this table, you load it. And what happens is you'll end up with a table. You'll end up with a table here and it'll have one column in it. So typically we'll say column one. Once you start adding measures, you can delete column one and you end up with a table here that has an interesting little, it has this icon, which means it's only containing measures at the moment. So measure tables are great, especially from a collaboration perspective on the similar note from collaboration. If you are doing some complex measures, uh, so and not that this is horribly complicated, but if you are doing some complex measures, it's always worthwhile, make this a little bigger, it's always worthwhile to do things like comment your code. Because this way, again, from a collaboration perspective, you can put inline comments in code. That's very useful, again, when you're handing this off to people, just like in Power Query, when you can add comments to elaborate or clarify some of the steps you're taking. Very similar here. You want to, if you're doing, especially if you're doing something very complex in your in a, in a measure. So that is a use, that's just one note there that I wanted to point out. A couple of notes on DAX itself, a couple of best practices that uh, always come to mind here. The first one is when we're talking about division. So let's grab a, let's go grab a quick one here. So when we're doing, when you're doing division, any kind of division in Power BI, it's always, always, always better <clears throat> to use the divide function. Um, and why, why is that rather than a slash or the forward slash you would typically use elsewhere? Why is that? Well, Power BI is optimized to read the divide function. So when it sends things back to a query engine, it's able to interpret what you're trying to do when it sees this function, this divide function. Strangely enough, when you put the, when you use a forward slash for division, Power BI has that, well, it, it figures it out eventually, but it has to have a little bit of internal, mod, a little bit of internal dialogue to figure out what's going on there and to figure out the best path to retrieving the data. So I think in this case, you know, using the divide here, one thing is that it's, it, it's a very, it's very efficient for sure using this divide function. The other thing is that it has a third parameter. So you have your, you know, your numerator, your denominator, and then you get this third parameter here. In this case, I used <clears throat> NA. What that does is that's a divide by zero handler. So if for any case you would have a you know a zero come through in your denominator, in your denominator, uh, the divide function will automatically replace that rather than throw an error. You don't get that advantage with the forward slash, or you have to write some more code to do it. Moving on a little bit here, we're going to talk a little bit. Want to talk a little bit more about uh, calculate as well, and I'm going to bounce over to a demo page here, to a page I have specific to demo here. I want to talk a little bit about Cal some of the best practices related to Calculate. And we're going to open up this table here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have a couple of formulas. I created a little subfolder here. And I want to take a look at different things that using the Calculate function and talk about filter context. Calculate is very good uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Calculate function. Calculate functions are excellent. They function a little bit, you know, they operate a little bit like uh, where clauses and a SQL query in that, you know, the, the effectively what they do is they create a table first. So when you create a calculate function, it'll go down to whatever your filter argument or your that according. So in this case, you know, what we're looking for is uh, clothing, clothing sales. I only want to know about clothing sales. So we've filtered the product table. We use this function filter. We're filtering the product table. And we're, once that's done, once Power BI understands this, then it goes back and calculates the total sales for clothing. Now, the thing to understand here is the way that some of these filter functions work. And it can get a little strange. You can definitely get some, uh, well, let's say odd, some odd results from this uh, with, without, without knowing it. So we'll take a look here. So we'll take this. We'll drop this in here first. We're going to drop in our calculate filter, and you can see here that's doing what we want it to do. That's just going to give us our clothing here. All right, now we have an, another sample here, and I'm going to show this one. So what this is doing, 
is you can see what's happened here. It's given me a result that I didn't quite expect. It's given me 1.7 uh, $1 million, which should be, which is our clothing function. You can see here our filter's working here. It's only giving me what I want for clothing. But here, what the heck's going on? Why is this repeated? Well, it's because I've used an other, another function here. So what the all function does is it tells Power BI that we're stripping off everything uh, from every external filter coming into the product table. And we're always only ever going to re return uh, a sum of, a, of our total sales for clothing. So regardless of what the category is over here on the left, it's always going to give me the value for clothing. Uh, and this, so I have another sample here to calculate with a very simple filter. I'll drop that in. That's just a direct filter applied. Now you can see what, what happened here. This is a very common construction, by the way, very common where people are, uh, <clears throat> you just filter, you don't necessarily need to uh, use a filter function to specify the table. You can just filter on a column directly in, in Calculate and it fills in the gaps. The thing that's happening here though, and you can see the results uh, under the hood, is that this construction here is considered what's called syntax sugar. It's shorthand. And what it's doing under the hood here when Power BI translates this is it's functionally identical to this. Now the best practice where if you want to, rather than write this type of construction, a best practice to avoid any kind of bizarre result like this is to use this instead. So keep filters. So the keep filters function, if we drop this in, it's gonna have something very similar to our first function or to the first example, first example we used. Our keep filters function is going to preserve, it's going to apply a filter here and it's going to look, it's going to respect filters that are coming in from the outside. It's not going to give us a total for that for sure. But what it's going to do is it's not going to give us a bizarre result here that we get for these two in the middle. So it's just worthwhile to understand how the filters are operating when you're working with Calculate. The other piece that you want to also note here, and we'll go, I'm gonna go back, back to our, our summary page. And I have a formula here. <clears throat> um, now, if I introduce variables, for instance, into formulas, variables are very useful. And you can see I have a variable here that I'm using to <clears throat> configure a, a title, a category title on some of these reports. And we'll see why in just a second. But what I'm doing here is when I'm using variables, because I have, I want to use this here. I want to look at my the selected value from a particular table here, which means that's getting passed into into my into my into my switch statement here, which is just a way a shorthand way of using a, a complicated a nested if statement. But rather than use this over again, because every time I use a measure in Power BI, uh, Power BI is going to calculate that measure. That can lead to some overhead. So what we do in, instead of using the same measure over and over again is you can use a variable. And what variable does when I use variables is it's going to lock this value. That way I can reference this variable again and again throughout the rest of my formula here. And it's going to retain whatever was locked in the first place. Power BI does not need to calculate this over and over again. And in a lot of cases, you're going to get significantly better performance out of measures that way. Now, the one exception to this rule is if you're using calculate. Calculate has a very strange way, not, not that anybody would ever do this uh, particular type of formula, but just wanted to use this as sort of a sample. <clears throat> Power BI will do a very strange thing when you're using calculate because it's what it's doing is each variable has its own quote unquote scope, which means that Power BI fixes the value and then moves on to the next variable. So in this case, we're looking for our month to date sales and it should match this current month revenue card here. But what happens if I create a new card? I take this and I drop it in here. What we get, we get something that's matching this, which is actually corresponding to my date filter. So what's going on here? Why am I not getting that? Easy, simple reason is because of the scope. So what Power BI did was it took a look at this first variable, the sales variable, and locked the sum of sales, which was corresponding to this filter here, our date filter. So it's going to give it sales for the whole year. Now, regardless of what we do here, regardless of what function we use later, Power BI is still going to keep this value. So the change we would need to make here 
is we would need to take this and put it inside the calculate function. We're going to do And so once I do that, and we're going to lock oh, this actually, sorry, I went to current month sales. Let's take that out, out of here. Yeah, I didn't like that. Yeah. Take this, take it, we're going to drop it there. And we're going to see what that did. Sorry, Power BI. Now, scope is properly set. I just noticed we had a blip on the screen about variables. Variables are very useful, but it's also very important to understand <clears throat> how variables work uh, when we're using things like calculate. Oh, uh, let's go back to DEX. So again, just to recap, before we hit any questions that anybody may have, uh, use the calculated columns sparingly because they add size to the data. And one thing to note too is because of how calculated columns work, that they're they're only calculated whenever the model refreshes. I should have added that earlier, but they're only calculated whenever the model refreshes. So they are poor candidates to use for aggregation. Measures are always the way to go for vet aggregation. They respond to filters. Calculated columns do not. Uh, unless the model is refreshed. Should always use explicit measures in non-table, non-matrix visuals. Uh, matrix measures should always live in their own table. Always use the divide function. Always be aware of how the filters are working when you're using calculate. And then use variables to rather than repeat references to the same measure. However, be careful when you're using calculate with variables. I'm going to pause here to see it. Pause here for any questions. All right. All right. Well, we'll move forward here. We're going to move on to just quickly, we're going to take a look at visuals very quickly. Now we're coming up on our time here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our visual best practices here. And we'll pop over to Power BI again. Things that right off the bat we should be aware of is that we want to limit the visuals uh, that we put on our page. Um, <clears throat> and you know, in this case, we have about seven visuals on the page. Part of that is Power BI renders the visuals every time you head to a new page. So that makes things a little bit faster, the fewer visuals we have. But also, you can completely overwhelm your end user. Um, one of the things that's always bothered me is when I see uh, sample images, even sometimes on, on Microsoft uh, documentation of Power BI dashboards, it can have you know, like 15, 20 visuals on the page, and your eye has nowhere, no idea where to go. So to really convey a clear story, best practice is to keep this, keep your visuals around eight or fewer on the page. Okay, and that's not counting slicers, but slicers do count as visuals. All right, and one thing too is if you do have a slow running page one of the one of the oh, one thing you can do too is there's a tab here there's this optimized tab up here in your ribbon uh one thing you can use is this performance analyzer here and what this is going to do is we start recording and we were to just refresh our visuals it's going to go through and render how long it took to render any of these uh, if i were to see anything with a very large number uh significantly larger than anything else in the page I can actually go in and check that out. I can actually go in, copy the DAX query, or I can run it in this new feature over here, the DAX query view, and I can keep playing with that until I get this to a point where I think it's going to run satisfactorily. But I can also see where you know bottlenecks are as visuals render. You know, if I have too many visuals on the page, that'll immediately let me know what's happening here. Let's stop that. The other thing that's really useful is if you're creating a large table, uh, and there's a very useful feature up here. In the upper, uh, like, so if I'm creating a detailed table, for instance, for a drill through, 
You can do visuals, which is really nice because Power BI is going to try to render your table column by column as you add pieces to it. In this case, by pausing the visuals, it allows you to add columns without having to wait for the whole thing to refresh. Once it's done, you can click refresh visuals, the whole table will refresh. So it's it's a very useful, very useful tool to use. Uh, another thing we're talking about too many visuals on the page. There's also a, a point where you can hit too many slicers on the page as well. I try to limit these to four to five slicers tops on the page. I don't count them as visual elements, but Power BI does. So you don't want, you know, obviously too many slicers would overwhelm your users for sure. But it's also the case that Power BI has to render those visual, has to render these slicers as visual elements on the page. That costs, that takes time, that takes memory. So what happens if you do need uh, additional slicers beyond, you know, around roughly four or five, as I mentioned, you can use the pane over here, your filters pane, which is really very place to have a user go in and 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 to be able to filter objects. A couple of things to note too: you need to have make sure that this little button here, this is showing, is you know, the pane is not hidden. Another thing that's useful too, if you're going to leverage the filter pane to allow users to filter uh, your report, whether it's at the visual level, the page level, or all pages, is to go through and if it's not being included, uh, it's kind of just go through and hide these fields so that when this is published to the Power BI service, this panel opens, you see the fields that you haven't, haven't uh, hidden out here. Helps them understand what, what actually can be used as an active filter versus what's just here from a table. Okay, I'm just going to collapse that. Um, <clears throat> other really useful tools, uh, if you're not using it, I highly recommend you know if you know if you want to get down to something like a detail level. I have a detail page down here for my, my sales. This renders is to use drill throughs to get to this page. All right. One of the things that uh, we can do so we can use the visuals on our summary page to help us get to our details and see the details underlying some of those visuals. Very easy to set up a drill through. Uh, let's just say I'll drop in, you know, country, uh, region. I'll put in collapse some of these so it's a little easier to work with. I'm gonna toss in a product category, uh, product name, product subcategory. So I've got a lot of things out here to use, let me get that category, subcategory in there too. Okay, I got a couple of fields in here to use. So what does this mean? Well, if I go back out to my executive summary over my mountain bikes here, and I can right click, or I typically I can either right click or hover, sometimes it comes up on hover, and now I have this option to drill through. I'm gonna click on that, And what I'm going to get back is a table that, is, so it actually has the dates, it retains the date filters, retains all of the items that come from that previous uh, from that previous table. It also does this, another thing too. It creates a handy bookmark up here to allow me to navigate back and forth. Bookmarks are fantastic, uh, highly, highly, highly recommended to use, especially if you're using a lot of slicers and filters. You can create a book bookmark here and you create uh, you can create a bookmark up here on the insert you can create a you know, add a button and you can then use that button to use the to use a bookmark here which you can uh, so great thing to use here you would save the default state of all of your filters you add a bookmark adding a reset button allows people to go back, back to the original original state here and then a couple of other things uh, I wanted to just highlight to you know kind of get through a way to sort of reduce some to reduce some uh, noise here uh, or to make things a little bit better for your users. One is to configure your tooltips, obviously to convey additional information rather than adding additional information to the page to keep the, that visual number down. And another day is when we're looking at formatting. For a visual 
visual. Notice when I hover over a visual, I get a lot of things, like a lot of these icons here. They multiply significantly in the Power BI service for some visual types. So if we come in here and we go to general, there is, uh, believe me, I only found this in the last year. So I, this is why I want to highlight this. There is a, uh, under general, there's header icons. And if I drop, if I expand this menu, my icons menu, I can surface whatever I need to for uh, for my end user. So I can, you know, I can keep some of these, or I can get rid of them all. And if somebody hovers over, they don't they don't see any of these icons. It's very very useful. Uh, it very makes it a, makes the experience a lot better for your end user. All right, and then I think what we're gonna do here is we can pause for just a second. Uh, see if we have any questions related to visuals. And if not, we'll do, um, let's give it another second here. All right. Uh, and what we'll do from here, uh, if not, is we will wrap on uh, collaboration and reusability, a couple of different things just to, just to think about when it comes, once the report is done and you need to share the report or there's other reusable pieces to it, we have a couple of options here. One is a way to collaborate with teammates uh, to move your files back and forth, whether it's through source control or you know SharePoint or you know whether Google Drive, whatever. Uh, two ways to really do that effectively are these PBIDS and PBIT files. PBIDS files are uh, pre-wired to have built-in source connections. Very useful. They don't have any data uh, associated with them by default, but they can. They have the connections. It's very easy to pick this up, start using, start building on top of them. The PBIT files are basically the, the entire file, uh, the visual layer and the data model <clears throat> in, from Power BI. But what that will allow you to do is, it's, is it allows you to make a very small file. So you pass that back and forth. Uh, it takes up very little storage space and allows your and allows your teammates to open it up, refresh it, and then they have the entire they have the full uh, report to be working with. Other piece here is you or, uh, reusable data sets. So once a report is published to Power BI, you know I'm sure all of you have noticed it splits into two pieces: report and uh, now it's called a semantic model with the introduction of Fabric, but it used to just be called a data set. Uh, what you can do from Power BI Desktop is connect directly to a data set. You can even do this in the Power BI service as well. And what this does is if you have a well curated data set, one of the things that um, <clears throat> this is going to do for you in terms, of, in terms of development is it's going to dramatically reduce your development cycle. The, the only downside of this, uh, aside from, you know, provides a single source of truth, which is fantastic. The only downside is that you can't build new measures or calculated columns. Uh, on these. You have to go back to the original uh, report, build them there. Thin reports, you, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck with what's there already. So it has to be the, you know, sort of the, uh, uh, sort of the Cadillac of, of data sets in order to really leverage a reusable data set effectively. And last but not least, one of my favorite tools inside Power BI is the data flow. Uh, data flow is available in the service. They're effectively, uh, a power, they're effectively an online version of Power Query. It's a tremendous way to, it gives you the sort of the benefit of a reusable data set, but allows you to pick and choose the tables you want. And you're not constrained by any limitations related to measures. You basically can, you, you sort of have a, a, I'd say a menu to pick from. And I like to, you know, I've often done this where you have a dimension uh, data flow and a fact table data flow. And you can pick and choose what you need to build out your report. Very, very, very useful tool. Can be combined with any other data source to build out your reports. Very, very good stuff. Uh, and again, online Power Query has all the same functionality. Actually, has a, a slightly better UI that I've read, I've read recently is coming to the, the desktop application. And with that, wrap up here. I did include in the deck here a number of uh, <clears throat> additional resources to check out here. Uh, some of these are just, you know, some Power Query or some Microsoft, uh, you know, blogs, community blogs, uh, and other things. Here we have here are you know, piece, tools developed or blogs developed by different users. Uh, there's SQL BI, tremendous DAX gurus, 
Chris Webb's BI blog. Chris Webb uh, was a tremendous, uh, wrote a number of tremendous articles about Power Query. He's now branched out into uh, Fabric. He's a, he's actually a, a Microsoft developer. He's he's really into the uh, really deep on the Fabric side of things. Havens Consulting also really good, uh, it's particularly in terms of new pieces that come out in Power BI. Uh, and then the last here is Ben Grabato. Ben Grabato has a Power Query free Power Query primer online which is fantastic for anyone looking for more uh, information on Power Query. All right, and with that, I wanna thank everyone for coming out. I hope this was useful. Uh, we'll kind of open up here if there are any questions. Uh, and if there aren't, I uh, just wanna say I really appreciate everyone coming out. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you everyone for attending. We are a bit over our time, so we will let everyone go, but uh, our team will be here for a little bit. So if you want to leave any comments that you have or questions in the chat, we will continue to answer those. If you have any specific questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly via email. And that email address is on screen there. It's connect at the virtualforge.com. We also offer consulting services in Power BI. We offer support. We offer training. So if you or your team is interested in either some one-on-one -on -one training, team training, there's various levels uh, that we can get into, as well as if you have any specific Power BI projects that you're interested in getting some help with, please don't hesitate to reach out. As mentioned at the beginning of this, you will be receiving a copy of these, uh, these slides, as well as a recording of this webinar for you to kind of pause and play around and see things happening live. Uh, with that, thank you so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thanks so much, everyone.